A big welcome to absolutely everyone here. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Sun. I'm head of content and research here at Analytics by Design. I will be your host for this evening. We have a very exciting lineup for you, so get comfortable. To kick us off, I would like to introduce you to Michelle Liu, the founder and president of Analytics by Design. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. You guys can hear me okay, right? Perfect. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in early or on time. My name is Michelle. I'm the founder and president of Analytics by Design. We're a nonprofit that is completely run by volunteers. Our mission is to lead a conversation of our future through the power of data, technology, and design. Just like many of you, we've felt the impact of COVID-19, and we're worried about many things. The economy, jobs, small businesses that are impacted during this pandemic. We think if we, if we can unite the industry to talk about the changes we are seeing so far in the consumer space, we might be, better, we might be able to better comprehend the world around us. In, in particular, we think we should pay special attention to the demographic. They are being impacted the most, notably the roughly 2 million Canadian who lost a job during this pandemic. And we also see the impact has been disproportionately larger uh, on a demographic like women, youth, and minorities. We should not forget small businesses. They are still struggling to survive. So tonight, we prepare you with a three exciting panel. The first one, the first one hour from 6.39 to 7.30 will be coping with changing consumer sen sentiment. We have invited speakers in both CPG and transportation to share their view and their discovery so far in the consumer space. And then in the second hour from 7.30 to 8.30 will be a talent pivoting at a time of a crisis. This is our startup panel. So we invite some startup CEO to talk about talent management strategy from both company and individual perspectives. The last but not least panel from 8.30 to 9.30 supporting smaller players. This panel is really exemplifying the excellence of this uh, virtual event. We invite a speaker from some of the largest technology company to share their stories of helping smaller players in this market. So tonight we have speakers from Ibrani Analytics, Shopify, Uber, Metrolink, Microsoft, Talentfit, Bazooka, Analyze HR, discussing the impact of COVID-19 on the job market, consumer, and SME. To bottle a quote that I really like from one of my favorite authors, Yuval Noah Hirahi, the storm will pass, humankind will survive, and most of us will still be alive, but we will inhibit a different world. I hope you enjoy tonight's conversation and feel free to engage with speaker and the fellow attendees using the chat and Q&A functions, and please ask a tons of questions. And obviously we have our hashtag tonight, ABD pause and restart. Please use that to share your thought with us. Thank you very much, and I will see you soon. Thanks, Michelle, for kicking us off. Before we dive into our first panel, let's go over some housekeeping items. First of all, some of you have already uh, discovered the chat functionality. In our virtual event, this is a great place for you to interact with all the other attendees. Feel free to say hello, share your LinkedIn profile, or any other thought that comes to mind. During our evening, we will also be taking questions from the panel. And so at the bottom of your screen, you'll also see a Q&A function. Now, uh, you can throw your questions in there at any point in time. And then when we get to the Q&A section of each panel, last 15 minutes of every single one, we'll try our best to answer all of those questions there. We will also be having people monitor those, those questions too. And so hopefully we'll be able to get back to you and answer everything that comes our way. Just like Michelle had mentioned, don't forget, we have a hashtag. Hashtag ABD pause and restart. You will see some of the ABTD team taking screenshots and posting those on Insta, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, you know, post a screenshot, post your favorite quote, whatever comes to mind, feel free to engage with us outside of the Zoom meeting. Okay, you ready? Enough of that, let's get to our content. I'd like to introduce our first panel, Coping with Changing Consumer Sent Sentiment. Wafiq will be your moderator for this panel. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah, and hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm gonna write, I'm gonna jump right into it. So, look, 2020 has no doubt been a year for the books. With the onset of COVID, Canada and the world had to go into lockdown, and mobility, as we know it, took uh, went to a halt. Conglomerates like Amazon uh, become not just convenient but essential 
And needless to say, the paradigm shifts that have been triggered due to the intensified digital experience have been astounding. Consumer sentiment was no exception. With that, I will introduce our two great panelists tonight. The first is Perry Hazen. He is a CPG practice lead at Inveronics Analytics. Perry has over 20 years of experience in product leadership, commercialized strategies, and leading client relationships in marketing analytics. Much of his career has been working within the consumer goods industry, including 12 years at Nielsen, where Perry led the consumer and shopper practice, launching several successful initiatives that drove significant growth to the consumer panel and segmentation business. Prior to Nielsen, Perry worked at multiple companies such as Dentsu Igis Network, Medcan Health Management, and Campus Search Map Info. Perry holds a Master of Management Analytics from Queen Smith School of Business and a Bachelor of Arts from Ryerson's Ge Geographic Analysis Program. Our other great panelist is Sharon Sue. She is the Director of Presto Payment and Business Intelligence at Metrolinx. Sharon focuses on building the next generation of payments products and unifying Ontario's regional fare experience through the Presto Fair Solutions and Data Insights. She is currently leading open payments rollout to allow transit users to pay their fares by tapping uh, the uh, transit users to pay their fares by tapping a contactless credit card, debit card, or mobile phone on a Presto reader. Prior to coming to Metrolinx, Sharon spent over 10 years in payment and loyalty at RBC, American Express, and TD Bank. She holds an MBA from York Schulich School of Business. And I'm your moderator. I'm, a, I'm currently a strategy and operations manager at Uber, uh, born in the field of transportation and super excited to be moderating this session with our two great panelists. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna jump into the questions. First and foremost, I would love uh, to understand from both Perry and Sharon, what are the trends that you've been observing so far in the consumer space since the, since the onset of COVID? Perry, maybe we can start with you. Sure, yeah. So from a um, CPG perspective, um, certainly a lot of us are now familiar with the fact that we've been at home quite a bit and probably eating much more at home than we ever have before. Uh, it should be no surprise that the consumer goods industry is actually performing very well, uh, despite the challenges that are happening. Uh, so you know, massive growth versus a year ago. Uh, this is primarily due to the effect of the closure of things like restaurants or other uh, items you may consume on the go. You're now fulfilling those needs at home, which means that you're, you know, you're just the, the pure number of meals you're having uh, is increased. Um, some of the biggest trends I think that uh, retailers have, have seen, number one, uh, just you know, with the, the uh, safety issues about going into the store itself, uh, the digital adoption has been much higher than, than, than anticipated. Uh, I heard you know, one retailer say that uh, the digital adoption you know, for their online platform that they expected to happen over the next five years literally happened within a, within a, a month or two, so which left them uh, really struggling to, to keep up with that demand. But I think now things are starting to iron themselves out and uh, there's a nice little trend now of, of, of uh, digital adoption that we hadn't seen before. Uh, it's also important to recognize that um, not all uh, consumers have been affected the same way. So as, as Michelle mentioned, uh, there's a, a sizable portion of the Canadian population that are, are without, uh, without employment. This has had an impact on their ability to uh, how they actually spend. So, you know, how we've been working with our clients really is helping them understand, number one, uh, how long will these trends last? You know, what does the future look like? And also where should they be focusing their efforts? So uh, from an Enveronics analytics perspective, really our, our response to that has been, let's look at this through the lens of, of segmentation and really understand, number one, accept the fact that not everyone has been uh, impacted the same way. Uh, we've actually uh, developed um, a series of uh, recovery products uh, designed to actually help our clients navigate uh, you know, these, these uh, challenging times. Uh, first and foremost, looking back at the fact that, you know, not, as I mentioned, not everyone is impacted the same, if we actually tie that back to you know which type of occupations are impacted the most, so a lot of us you know working in white collar uh, industry have the ability to retain our jobs, work from home. We're very fortunate, but that's not the case for many Canadians. So it's really uh, understanding what what segments have actually been impacted, uh, understanding where they are located, so that uh, you you actually can localize where that that impact is occurring. Secondly, we've also looked at the concept of vulnerability. Uh, so this actually comes through in a few flavors, uh, most importantly, financial vulnerability. Uh, so we've done this by actually looking at uh, various um, wealth information of Canadians, like looking at some of the things like liquid assets or the amount of mortgages they have, 
because really when we talk about vulnerability, it's not just, uh, you know, who are the low income people in, in this, in, in, in the country. It's who are the people who are un, unprepared to be without income. So you might have a, you know, a family, they have a very large mortgage, that sudden loss of income can be very detrimental to the fact that they can't pay that, uh, that mortgage. So uh, our, we have a product specifically designed to actually identify uh, where people at most risk from losing their income so that uh, you know, uh, our clients can actually um, manage that accordingly. And uh, lastly, one of the most exciting things that we've been working with uh, in the last um, year or so is uh, access to mobile movement data. So this is a completely anonymized um, tracking of, of mobile devices. Uh, so again, um, we have no idea who it is, but we can actually get some very interesting patterns of information on, on how people are moving uh, out and about, especially under, uh, under quarantine. Uh, we actually developed a specific product called uh, the Out and About Database. And what that is, is actually looking in specific neighborhoods, uh, what, what, um, how far are actually people leaving their home? So if they've actually gone more than 500 uh, meters away from home, we actually consider that to be uh, you know, venturing away or being more out and about. That information is very uh, powerful and actually is uh, number one quantifying what areas are actually opening up faster than others, looking at actually uh, where they're going, uh, are they actually going back to the usual place of work, uh, are they going back to school. Uh, there's a lot of rich data there that we can mine to actually inform like what retail trading areas are actually opening up faster than others, um, you know, where are people more cautious about those safety measures? So it, it really, again, provides our, our clients with that guidance of where they should be focusing their efforts. So again, the combination of these things are really helping to, um, um, again, prioritization and, and really focus are really the key things here. Thanks, Barry. That's, that's very insightful. I have a follow-up, but I want to hear from Sharon first as well about what trends have you seen in the world of transportation in Toronto and beyond. Yeah, sounds good. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. And thanks for staying extra late um, out of your <laughs> work hour to be with us. Um, unlike Perry, there's, um, his industry is probably benefiting more from the pandemic. Uh, the industry that I'm in for the public transportation is probably um, one of the industry definitely um, suffer. Um, just imagine yourself at the beginning of pandemic, you probably haven't taken a transit, a bus, or anything in that nature for a while. Um, so from the lowest point when we started at the beginning of the pandemic, I would say probably um, early April is the lowest point that we've seen in terms of ridership. We're definitely like, this is a public information. I think TDC did announce like it was 80, 90% down of their regular volume. Um, and that just translates the revenue loss from the day-to-day -day ridership revenue, as well as Presto as a payment service provider um, to all the 11 transit agency in the GTHA in the Ottawa area. So our industry is definitely hitting way more than um, the consumer goods and simply because we are in the business of moving people. And with, pandemic, with COVID, um, people are concerned about safety and security and, and the an ability to have social distance. So the first month was definitely a very difficult time. Um, all, I don't think anyone was anticipating things in this magnitude. And as a result, you can see there's a lot of policies of change, um, even the mass policy um, in Toronto as well as each transit agency has like evolved over the time. But the good thing is that I think as we open up for phase two and phase three, we start seeing some of the customer has not right for transit for two months and come back to the system. And gradually we're seeing a good sign of a gradual uh, transition um, from the bottom to today is probably like 20, 30% of recovery depending on the different transit agency. Um, so that's, that, that makes us feel hopeful. Um, we do feel like there's a couple of trains that was definitely um, exciting and, and, um, and, and hopeful for us to see this as an opportunity to pause and start back to the topic of today. Um, like the behavior change and with the pandemic, people want to self-serve themselves. They want to buy and preload their car before coming to the station. They want to minimize the interaction in station with devices. They want everything to be contactless. 
Um, and then the definition of contactless has evolved with um, pandemic. Before, it just means your contactless card that you tap on the machine for checkout. A contactless with pandemic now has a new definition. Anything, you just don't want to touch the surface. And that becomes a mentality of people. People want to go digital, like Perry has mentioned. Um, but people also want cashless to some degree because they're worried about cash should be another media of um, carrying the virus. And that becomes a, equally a concern for a lot of transit agency because they want to make sure their staff and employee are safe and, and not have to expose to additional risk. So cashless um, and how long the cashless and to what a degree of cashless will look like will be another really interesting topic for North America in particular. Um, however, similar to Paris point, <laughs> the flip side of the cashless, there's also numerous articles already talking about in the Wall Street journals and a lot of uh, media. Usually when the organization chose to go ahead with cashless, unfortunately, there are some um, equity issue could potentially be left behind because there are certain dynamic and segment of people may only have cash to go about for their day to day. And if the society moved towards the cashless and that what does that mean to um, the equity group and those segmentation that we may not be able to serve. So that's also another evolving topic that we are closely monitoring. And another thing that I'll say is like, um, discretion travel is becoming more and more um, dominant method um, of travel reason before people travel for going to work nine to five, but now people choose, um, they have multiple mode of transportation option they can choose from. People, some people have concern about their safety as a result of choose driving, um, but some people would like to avoid the traffic because I think if, if you have been on the roll, you're probably seeing sometimes on the weekend, your traffic in and out of the city is actually getting worse than it was before. So some of them people chose to use the public transit for a discretionary reason um, to go to Niagara Falls, for example, um, as a result. And one last thing that I found was an interesting trend is that we always know data is important, um, but I think many organizations will probably agree during the pandemic, we realized the data that we have is not enough. <laughs> the data we have is a very um, kind of after the fact analytic. Um, with pandemic, everyone is like, when is the ridership will recover? When things will back to normal? And then we realized that a lot of predictive um, algorithm and investment that we probably should have met and made earlier on would have paid off way more than um, in the current situation. So that's another thing that I think we're, I think I spoke to many people in the industry, people find a general like kind of topic and, and opportunity that we can pause and start and, and restart to think what, how we can collectively tackle them like, as a community. Very interesting points. And especially the, uh, the final point on data, I felt like, Maybe Metrolinks and Infronics and Otix can probably talk together about this and see how they can uh, collaborate here. Um, I mean, I think we saw some of the trends as well in the world of Uber. Uh, I think our earnings call was uh, a week ago in which we saw that um, transportation, you could see that our revenue probably dropped by 60 to 70%. And you look on Uber Eats, it's like explosion. And then you, you got us venturing to grocery because you see so much traffic and so much demand on that kind of convenience coming in right now. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on something that you both uh, um, kind of mentioned um, using P Perry's words, uh, use the term venturing away. And I, I would love to understand like who's venturing away. Are they in, in the city or are they in the suburb? Uh, I guess in, in uh, to summarize my ask, who is that post COVID consumer or that consumer that's actually bouncing off to the new normal? And what are their characteristics from the data that you've seen so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, from what we've seen in our data, like there's there's definitely some interesting patterns that we're seeing, uh, and who's actually more likely to go away. Like when we look across the country, previously we saw that you know certain regions were a little more comfortable. Like I think we saw a little bit more mobility, more mobility happening within uh, within Quebec. Um, certainly, also within within uh, smaller town and rural areas, probably just due to the nature of of you know how close the nearest grocery store is. 
uh, you know, people in those areas are actually you know, uh, are more likely to travel further out of necessity rather than, uh, you know, purely just venturing them, themselves. So we've always just um, really brought it back to understanding, like, what are some of the motivators uh, behind that? So again, there's, there's a segment of the population that uh, are still working. So, you know, while many people can work from home, uh, which is nice, many people uh, that are considered to be essential workers are still having to go out and about. So again, it's more of a, a necessity rather than a, a willingness. And then um, demographically, you know, you may find that uh, younger people are more uh, apt to travel further. Where if you're like a more elderly or senior, you're more comfortable staying at home. So again, a variety of patterns were actually seen uh, in the data that we're looking at. Yeah, similar to Perry, I think um, as uh, phase two open up, we start closely monitor like the behavior. One of the obvious trends similar to Perry's is we saw people with the student conception is picking up in the entire ridership. And speaking to my neighbors, of course, if you have like um, experience with teenager, they're all so bored at home. And as soon as the phase two open up, they're just eager to go out and meet their friends even in the park or, or go somewhere. And as a result, they usually don't have a car and uh, they take public transit. And that was the obvious pickup that they definitely, um, the trade-off between safety, um, the convenience you get to a place rather than probably like troubling their parents to give them a ride or borrowing their car. It's easier for them to take the transit. So definitely, I, I agree that the younger people who has probably stronger need for the social reason and less concern about the safety and security. And as a result, we definitely see a pickup for um, the user in that demographic. Um, I would say like similar to my earliest point, um, we saw more and more people use um, transit for discretionary um, recreational reason on the weekend um, to avoid the traffic. And also I think that one thing that I kind of observe um, and one of my personal um, belief of the future train, nothing to do with my work per se, but I think um, with pandemic people really have the opportunity to learn what's the best way to spend their time. And, and then people want to spend time for the things that's truly valuable to their day to day. And things such as planning the logistic, planning from A to B is now one of the valuable thing to do. So they will want to plan ahead, buy the tickets ahead, knowing exactly what time of the train that they will get on. The trip planning together with your um, rider, um, kind of your payment of the uh, transit experience become extremely important because people would just want not show up and feel panic and feel like you're not able to manage the crowd, how much people. People want to be able to plan and have expectation of what they're going to experience. And as a result, that for people that they feel like weekend there would be lots of traffic, they can take the train from Union to Niagara or St. Catherine area for the recreational reason um, and avoid spending sitting in the traffic for two hours and that's a better use of their time. And as long as the transit provider can provide a safe and secure environment, um, in this case, Go has done a pretty good job to provide that to the customer. Um, we start seeing some of those customers coming back and start using the transit for that reason. Very interesting, very interesting. I'm still trying to figure out how to manage uh, working from home with the, with the baby in the background. So if anyone's hearing that, uh, I guess, sorry, but not sorry at the same time, just how it is these days with COVID and um, kind of goes with the con shifting in con consumer sentiment as well. Um, we talked a lot about like changes that are happening right now and we're seeing a little bit during recovery. Who knows what the future is gonna look like? Uh, we don't have the data, we don't necessarily, we haven't really experienced this before in a way that we can actually build on. But I'd love to look at, basically, I'd love to pick your brain and under and kind of see what do you think um, or what do you expect to persist in terms of the recovery to shifts that you're seeing right now in the short term? And uh, what are the key lessons that we're learning from this pandemic right now? We can maybe start with you, Sharon, this time. Yeah, um, I, I definitely think being creative is critical. Um, I share one of example to Rafi Clay. Last week, two weekends ago, I went to Prince Edward County 
um, they finally have the like, indoor dining. And the first thing I sat down, the waiter said to me, please take your phone and scan our menu from this QR code. Um, I was definitely shocked, and, but I was like, this is brilliant because before COVID, imagine how many people will have reaction of, oh, no, I don't have a QR code reader, I don't want to. But the waiter was very kind and nice to explain to me, this is our safety measure so we don't have to clean the menu after every customer touch it. We don't have to worry about all the things in that nature. Being creative and leverage the opportunity to drive digital first, I definitely think will become the train. And to Perry's point, because the force behind us give customers a strong enough reason to change and shift up their behavior and adopt different, different way of servicing than it was before. Um, and also, like I remember in that restaurant experience, it's like um, we would like to have only one bill no split bill because you don't want more people touching the terminal. Um, and all those things are um, be creative um, and um, try and error. I think that that's kind of one of the lesson and learn. I think we will probably walk through of this pandemic and all find it um, having a, a hot moment after. Um, and the second thing that I would say is like, I definitely think that um, being, um, being able to help your customer during the difficult time will carry your brand a significant value along the way. Equally, um, spending effort, um, making sure the lower income and equity kind of segment are equally served and being taken care will be important because people will remember during the difficult time the good things you do for them. And now is a perfect time for reset and for people to see uh, we're turning a new leaf and we as a society and communities are going and doing better as a whole and we don't left anyone behind. So I feel with, um, with COVID, I definitely feel like I personally spend more time and money with my local store. And I know sometimes I'm way paying way more premium than I should have, but I just feel like I don't want my local stores to become, like I don't want my local butcher shop becomes no longer exists they cannot compete and they're suffering during, during the COVID time. So like buying from local, um, help the people and help the people in the community will become a one of the important value, I think, for a lot of brands. Perry, over to you. Great. No, I, I definitely want to build on Sharon's point there that, uh, yeah, creativity is, is key during these interesting times. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, um, you know, in the CPG space, you know, a lot of that that volume that they're 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 enjoying right now is is really coming at the expense of restaurants. So, as Sharon mentioned, like if these restaurants start to reopen slowly, that that volume will start to slowly shift back. But again, we know that disruption creates opportunity. So it's really uh, starting to think about it in terms of like uh, creative ways of of solving uh, consumer challenges. Uh, one thing we like to talk about is that you know, in addition to understanding the consumer, it's just understanding uh, individual occasions. So whether it be like, you know, um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, or those snacking uh, moments, because we're all slightly doing something different now, there's opportunities to create new ways of solving for those. Um, you know, we saw that, you know, things like, for example, even like going to the grocery store, if there's a lineup, you may be apprehensive about actually taking the time to go to the grocery store and potentially would fulfill some of those, those uh, needs in other channels. Like, for example, I think we've seen in convenience stores, the amount of uh, spending on grocery items in convenience stores has actually dramatically gone up as well. So, you know, as a convenience retailer, you're thinking about like, you know, how can I take advantage of that by coming up with, you know, unique value propositions to take advantage of the fact that, you know, I have this new traffic coming into my store. Um, some things that will stay, I, like I think online adoption uh, for the most part uh, will be much more advanced than it ever was before that will continue. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there will be people who will like start to prefer to go back in store, but definitely retailers, I think you'll see them investing much more in their online capabilities than they ever have uh, before, especially as a, as a strategy to combat uh, Amazon. Uh, things like the, the, the way things that we see uh, in, in the grocery store and like the hygiene requirements, like the, um, the safety guard, plexiglass. I don't think that's going away. Actually, I think that's here to stay now. Uh, it's like yeah. a, new, a new normal. So th some things you know, won't always go back to the they were, but will just evolve into something new. Um, and 
um, home meal location. So we actually see that um, bringing it back to the fact that, you know, more employees now actually see that working from home is not as, as scary as they actually thought it was. Mm -hmm. And maybe while uh, not everyone will be working from home full time, that tolerance to maybe have a portion of the employee base work from home more frequently still means that you're going to be consuming less on the go around your office or your place of work and more things actually in the household. So therefore, there probably will be this lag effect of volume occurring within in, in, in the grocery industry. Um, but other, other players like uh, the, the, the meal kits, like HelloFresh, et cetera, have a great opportunity to, to can capitalize on those uh, uh, increased occasions at home. So really, again, everything's changed. It probably will stay that way uh, for a while. Some things may go back, but we're definitely in a major shift now. Yeah, I was saying that um, I personally observed that I no longer buying toilet paper and anything <laughs> big in grocery store because yep. I feel it was just a panic attack when I see my full grocery carts all full and I have so many things to unpack and yep. all those big items are gone to Amazon now because I just I want to show up at my door <laughs> and even sometimes that means I pay a little bit more premium. Mm -hmm. Or you subscribe and get a 15% discount for bi-weekly yeah. deliveries. I do that for diapers. Um, but beyond that, completely agree with the points you guys mentioned. I uh, love the, uh, the point about how disruption or creates opportunity or at least paves the way for opportunity. And I can continue to be amazed by the, the changes that we, we've been witnessing so far and how we adapted so quickly to them. Um, on that note, has consumer loyalty been impacted in any way? And I asked because I read a recent report on McKinsey that mentioned that COVID delivered a shock to loyalty as consumers were not able to find their uh, preferred brands due to supply chain in inefficiencies. And like the point that Sharon mentioned, people are just uh, shopping at maybe closer locations or supporting uh, 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 smaller owned businesses or local owned businesses. So have you guys seen that shock in Canada, uh, whether it's in retail or how, uh, from a transportation perspective, do we see major mode shifts that are here to stay as well? I'll start with you, Perry. Yeah, no, uh, certainly like, I mean, you raise a good point that uh, product availability played a key role. Uh, you know, you, you go to the store, you, you don't find what you're looking for. You're forced to make another decision that, that, sometimes can have a lasting effect. Like if you buy another product and that fulfills your needs and you're happy with that experience, uh, you may stick to it. So, um, so definitely a lot of uh, supply chains were affected. Um, a lot of CPG manufacturers specifically had to really focus on their core products to make sure they were on shelf because, you know, literally that, you know, whatever selling, just getting, you know, the, the focus on the main products is the, the, is the priority. So they had to make some tough decisions in, in cutting out Maybe uh, some of those products are a little more, more rare, like, um, you know, special flavors or, or uh, varietals that, you know, is, is a smaller segment of their business. They had to literally cut away. So people who are used to looking for those things now are left to make a new decision. And, and in some cases, those aren't coming back for a while. It's not just a matter of, you know, we'll just wait a few weeks. Like, no, they've actually discontinued that for the foreseeable future. Um, so, so definitely uh, that, that's changed. And again, I, to my earlier point, that uh, disruption creates the opportunity of like, what things can you um, offer to the consumer that will uh, meet their immediate needs. Um, another example, like for like product availability, availability, I'm sure a lot of people saw flour at the grocery store was out, uh, out of stock for many times. And, and some of the retailer uh, manufacturers like, like Smuckers actually end up producing like these massive flour bags um, and I mean, I think everyone was doing a lot of baking. So, uh, you know, just again, thinking about, uh, you know, new ways of, of using those products and, and, and shifting the, the amount of uh, items you can use that for has, has changed. So, again, I, I think um, that will continue to stay as well, too. Um, loyalty, again, from the perspective of e-commerce, that's actually been very detrimental to a lot of retailers who, you know, had very loyal customers going to their stores, uh, having that shift. Uh, potentially from one re retailer to another retailer altogether because of the online platform that they're offering can, you know, you almost, you potentially could have lost that, that customer for, for quite a while. So um, you, you will probably see retailers continuing to invest more in e-commerce, especially from a profit, pro, um, profitability stand perspective as well. Um, so yeah, lots going on. Amazing. Amazing. Turning to you, Sharon, on the world of mobility, do we see, 
the, we, we know that uh, open air transportation is taking um, kind of as riding a wave right now. Um, private vehicle sales are going up in places that have uh, recovered like China, for example. Uh, and, you, and at the same time in other cities like Paris, you see that they're basically trying to reshape how the city actually functions, limiting private transportation and actually focusing more on public transit and open air transit and walking. Uh, so in the world's transportation, how do you see these shifts happening? And um, what do you think consumers can expect? Uh, understand that you have to some, maybe voice your own opinion here. So feel free to do that. Yeah, for sure. Um, um, I think, um, go back to my beginning point, I think trends is one of the industry hit harder than consumer goods. So like, I feel like the um, loyalty is, is a very different question. I think now is more a critical time for public transportation to remain attractive option for a customer rather than driving. And I think that is the million dollar question that uh, we spend most of our time to figure out what are the drivers that will change and drive that behavior. My personal belief back to the point is that in order to make it attractive in the COVID time, pricing to certain segmentation could be more irrelevant, meaning because I could afford driving, in order for me to feel safe, I may prefer driving than taking the public transit. However, if you take the time you spend in the car, that could be used for something else or an easy and enjoyable bike ride in a public transit and you get there faster as a family, that could become more compelling. And how to make transit attractive and that need to be part of the journey planning that you know how you can get from A to B most efficient and lots of uh, sitting in the traffic and wasting the time and money with your family that is the important part of um, a reason to travel. Be also like the, and I think as we all know, City of Toronto already expanding and have planned to expanding the um, bike lane. Um, incorporate multi-mode of transit options. It could be train plus or streetcar plus um, bike share and things in that nature will become a dominant like train in my opinion because people would like to know the option and better integrating the multiple different transit mode and or walking um, will become a very critical part of the transit industry. Um, today the word of a transit app or Google help you to plan your trip um, I definitely personally think that there will be a deeper integration in the future for people to feel that they're better in control of their situation rather than me driving at 5 p.m. Whether I'll hit a traffic or accident on 401 or not, it's really not up to me. So I feel like the making the transit more attractive feel make people feel they're better in control of their time and is indeed a better use of their time will become a more critical question for us to um, continue to be relevant and really make uh, transit a more obvious choice that for customers. Hundred percent. I mean, it's so essential that we manage transit uh, and continue to kind of offer that service because so many communities rely on it in such in so many ways, and it's just unaffordable to be able to switch completely to the world of, of the private vehicle. In my opinion, uh, I think we're probably facing the same challenges in the world of Uber as well. How do you um, how do you ride the recovery wave in a way that uh, actually appeals to the consumer sentiment as it is today? Uh, the world of transportation mobility in general is kind of either forming partnerships or uh, um, kind of consolidating in different ways to actually meet that expectation. But the future remains so interesting and uncertain, and but ripe with opportunity. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and uh, read a few. Uh, questions from the attendees. Um, note to the attendees as well, I think there's um, some very interesting discussion happening in the chat. Uh, I highly recommend dropping your questions in the Q&A, not the chat because it's easier to follow, but I noticed that there are questions here and there, so I'll try my best to catch uh, a few from every um, feature over here for Zoom. So starting with the Q&A, I have a question from Chad. What role do you see movement data having in advising people on how to transport themselves from A to B? For example, home to work or home to the grocery store. Do you see a future where people get 
prompted with COVID updates and advise about when to transport themselves because there might be a large number of users about to go on board on a train. Uh, I think that the question is for you, Sharon. Yeah, so I think um, we we already start seeing, uh, for example, Rocky Man start um, having the option for people to um, interact and providing uh, crowdsourcing intelligent information on the TTC bus, for example, um, and collecting the data um, to help us to predict the capacity on the train and the bus. Um, I do think that will continue to stay and, and there will be more development to help people to get better information as part of trip planning, knowing how many people before you show up in the station, um, how many people would likely in the capacity look like for your train will definitely become part of the critical decision making for people to decide which mode they use. Very cool. And for the home to um, grocery store, transport themselves from A to B, like I definitely know that um, the Australian Go station has the grocery pickup service. Um, and um, uh, things like the grocery pickup along the way of your day to day journey will likely to be a train that will stay just similar to the online grocery or mail prep that send it to your doorstep. Um, those are definitely um, trains that we start seeing as well. Oh, yeah, very true. And, and I would also add that uh, I've, I've become a loyal um, customer to Corner Shop. So the, 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 the movement from A to B, from the home to the grocery store, is no longer in, on my list, which I think is probably the case for many people as well. Uh, but on the, on the topic of grocery stores, um, another question from the audience. Currently, we see arrows on the ground to dictate how people move. A lot of people don't use this stuff. Um, it's like, it's kind of, a, there's an inertia to kind of follow those, uh, those rules when people have been using a grocery store in one way or another for so long. Um, how do you think this type of system can better be implemented? And, uh, and I saw a different question in, in the chat that also says, how long do you think this will be uh, around for? Perry, maybe you can help us answer this question. You know, that's a great question. And um, I think so, a lot of those arrows were put down uh, before the mandatory masks uh, came into play. So, I mean, in some cases, depending on the size of the store, you know, it, it may be more important than others. But certainly, I know it, it's super frustrating. I mean, I know even from my, my own perspective, you know, you're at the end of the aisle and the arrows are going on the, on, in the wrong direction and you're just like cursing. Uh, why do I have to walk all the way around? So I think about, you know, how consumers actually shop a store isn't necessarily in the most logical way. Like, you know, naturally we're, we're gonna go down an aisle and realize we forgot something, wanna go back two steps. So I think, to be honest, like I think it's less about like how the flow of the store is and maybe if there's somehow like technology that can be used to help people guide them through like how they can move through the store efficiently. Like, you know, all the things on their shopping list, how do I get that in a very organized way? Um, so maybe there's like a, a, an opportunity to create an app there that will kind of, you know, be your concierge to walk you through the store. Um, but I, I, I definitely see from what I observed is, you know, two camps of people, those that follow the arrows religiously and others that refuse to. And so you're always going to have that, that, that friction. Uh, unfortunately, like the, the staff can't monitor it as, as much. You find that customers themselves are getting into fights with other customers over, over these, over the arrow. So um, I do think the arrows are a little bit less uh, of an issue, you know, as long as everyone is mandatorily wearing the masks. Um, so, you know, but they probably will be there for a little while. Very it's true. an interesting situation. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and honestly, building on the, the, the line that you've said, disruption uh, should create opportunity. Maybe we see grocery stores be reorganized in a way that just makes a lot more sense. And, and you know, from a user experience standpoint, and then that kind of systematic inertia will be dissolved a little bit. Uh, another question for you, Perry. Um, and, and I see a lot of questions here in the comments by, by the attendees, which is amazing. Uh, I would say some of these questions actually make a lot of sense to be asked for the third panel uh, that focuses on small businesses. So please uh, keep those in mind and drop them again in the Q&A once we get to that third panel, which I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, but one question here that kind of crosses between the two panels, uh, are we anticipating a partial yet permanent loss of revenue in the post-COVID world? 
uh, because of the kind of different changes in consumer sentiment and how people are not necessarily buying things that they didn't buy before. And it also builds on the topic that you mentioned before on maybe people because they're not working from home anymore or as or sorry, working from the office as much, the, the kind of commerce that happened around the office uh, is no longer as uh, as active. And if, if it's the case that we expect that kind of permanent loss of revenue, how are we preparing for that lower demand? Or how should businesses potentially prepare for that lower demand? Uh, sorry, for me first? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, no, certainly, I mean, um, uh, your, your point's valid that, you know, businesses around office locations will probably, realistically, it, it, they probably will never go back to the level that they were for quite some time. So uh, I'd say that, uh, you know, considering that spending typically is a result of shifting dollars, right? So if it's, it's kind of going from one area, it's going to another area. So as I mentioned earlier, like the, the increased volume in grocery is coming to the expense of things around those business areas that will, um, uh, that will continue to, uh, to occur. Um, sorry, actually, can you just repeat, repeat the question one more time there? <laughs> so you remember repeating the question? I just sort of lost it in the, in the window. For sure, no, yeah. Yeah, but the question basically is like, do, should we be expecting a permanent loss of revenue as a result of COVID? Uh, oh, yes. If yeah. the case, how do we best prepare for that? Yeah, I mean, it'll definitely, uh, depending on the, the types of products. Like, I mean, I, I, I know there's been some really unusual purchases this year. Uh, so again, for, for people who haven't necessarily been financially impacted, I mean, even looking outside of, of, of grocery itself, um, I know like categories like um, for things like around the house, like do-it-yourself product uh, projects like painting and uh, anything to sort of improve the aesthetics of your home is actually, we've seen huge spending there because people have had the time to focus on that. Um, so just given the financial resources of consumers, where they have time to focus on things, like I think you can actually see where there's going to be um, more spending than others. And so other other areas where they just, you know, will not, those those consumers won't be present or really where will be, will be most impacted. 100%. Sharon, um, I'll ask you the same question in the role of transport, and I'll, I'll also add uh, Wee Wang's question, and we'll call it, we kind of uh, end with it as well. Is Metrolinx actively reviewing and updating its upcoming projects, such as Your Ontario LRT, uh, to adapt to the post COVID 19 public transport landscape? Yeah, for sure. I, I can answer that question probably faster, and that's a longer question for the, the original question, how the business awesome. will look like in the future. Um, for sure, like um, COVID has changed significantly how um, our ridership look like, and like I mentioned before, COVID would definitely, um, con like the contours and the safety concern will come remain in people's heart. Um, so like for, for a good example that we've been looking at uh, for the new transit line expansion is to how can we reduce the reliance on devices and how can we ensure when a lot of those uh, subway extension line has multiple uh, transit agency and transfer point. So when we design the station, we need to make sure there's not lots of a need when you go to a different level and you have to find the devices to load or deal with anything related to transfer or payment related issues. So that definitely was the COVID. There's more um, design thinking going into a new extension line to really build in with the COVID my side, build in with the contourless experience and self-serve experience to the new subway extension. So that's for that question. To your, to your original question, um, definitely, I, I, I don't have the crystal ball whether the revenue will look like um, back to normal in a year or six months. Um, but I do think that the structure eventually when the population grow will eventually go back to the normal, but not with the exactly same mix. I think the way the money will make and how the different um, major revenue stream could potentially shift and change and maybe through some um, better integration within the region, there also will be better efficiency created for the transit system. So I don't think it will look exactly the same in terms of how they will look different and when we'll go back to normal. I really don't have the crystal ball for it. I mean, I was, I was hoping someone would have 
it's my yeah i was hoping someone would have the crystal ball to be honest uh would help a lot with kind of shaping Does that my... make it less exciting do you think um for <laughs> all of us we have an important role to play uh, to shape how the future will look like and disruptions opportunity that's a very good point i was looking at it from a capitalist perspective where i could maximize my gains over the next two three years in the stock market but uh you make a very good point anyways um Thank you guys so much. This was a great discussion. Thank you, Perry. Thank you, Sharon. I've learned a lot. Um, even though I'm in the world of transportation and I've been witnessing consumer sentiment change in front of my eyes, I still had the, the chance and the opportunity to learn so much from this discussion and uh, looking forward to staying in touch as well. Uh, that said, guys, we have a lot of content coming up there. We still have two more panels, one on talent and the other on small businesses. I see a lot of questions that actually fall in the second bucket and I'm sure all of you are thinking about how could you uh, if, if how could you could potentially shift careers within this uh, kind of climate and environment so without further ado i'm going to break it back to sarah and she will take us through the remaining two panels thank you so much everyone <laughs>